在庭院里和丈夫及儿子闲话家常，看起来就像一般的退休生活。不过，这样的悠闲时光，对一向忙碌的挪威前总理格罗哈莱姆·布伦特兰夫人来说，却是弥足珍贵。布伦特兰夫人打破性别成见，成为挪威第一位女性总理，也曾在 SARS 肆虐期间带领世界卫生组织平息疫情。不过，他对这个世界最大的贡献，在于他早在1987年就定义什么是永续发展。过去几十年，他更努力在人类经济发展与社会公益之间寻求均衡发展，因此获得唐奖第一届永续发展奖的肯定。President Ma, please present the Tang Prize Medal. 年轻时，布伦特兰夫人在奥斯陆大学取得医学学位。不过，她的人生抱负远远超出单纯的悬壶济世。I didn't think to become, you know, a surgeon or a clinician. I was thinking about society. I was thinking about public health, about preventive medicine, and to have an, a profession. That can help me understand human, you know, people, their surroundings, and to understand society better. So this is why I chose to become a doctor in the first place, and I went directly after my studies to Harvard School of Public Health in the U.S. because I wanted to study public health. 学成归国之后。布伦特兰夫人随即进入工位部门工作，没想到在三十五岁时面临人生第一个挑战。挪威总理邀请她加入内阁，担任环境部长。I uh, that in order to say yes to the prime minister to become member of government and minister at that time, I had to discuss with my husband. If he could take a bigger part of the responsibility for the children than he had until then, he said yes. And I said I told him for the first, you know, around ten years of our marriage, although we have shared duties, I had done the biggest share. He knew that, so he felt it was a natural thing for him now. To change this and become more of the dominating figure in the home for the children. Now, not every husband in 1974 would have done it as easily as he did. This here is my children. These were taken in our home when the children grew up, the four children, and this is only a few months after I became minister of environment. So the the kids are eight, and then nine and a half, eleven and a half, and thirteen and a half. Okay. His son also jokes about how he used to hold his mother's hand when he was a child. The funny thing is, when I see her in totally private, she's laughing. 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 In the summer holidays, she can sit there and talk about things that is is not very interesting at all for other people. But still, they are around and they talk and they listen and they comment and everything. Bulun Tlan 夫人从此踏上政治不归路 I was asked to to be willing to stand as the deputy leader of the party in 1975. To me, it was quite shocking because I had little political experience, in my own opinion. This one is when I am a young environment minister and deputy leader. So this is the leader of the party. This is the prime minister. This is the former prime minister, the one that I served first. And this is the party secretary. So here you have the leadership. Of the country in the end of the 70s. And you 
were the only women there. Abs oh, yes, as you can see, yeah. yeah. And of course, then I knew that my destiny could be that in the future, maybe I will become the first woman leader of the party. Yes. And six years later, I was. Mm. So it happened step by step from all of a sudden becoming an environment minister to becoming deputy and then leader of the party and then prime minister. Every Norwegian knew Gro Harlem Brundtland ah, because she was the first female prime minister in Norway yeah. in 1981. Yeah. And she was, well, uh, that was quite controversial in Norway at that time. Mm -hmm. So, I, uh, well, I think because she was female. a woman, mm -hmm. she well, was more criticized than all the male prime ministers was before her. This here is Brundtland, who is taking care of the home. This is my husband, and me and the one of the children outside our house. <laughs> so, you know, they took pictures, they commented on these things. Well, this here, I was receiving something called the Onassis Prize. Uh -huh. And one of the other awardees was Ted Turner. Ted Turner of CNN. Yeah. yeah. So this picture was taken, and it was used in the Norwegian papers, making fun of my husband holding the bag. Yang <laughs> <laughs> 继续在永续发展的议题上，做他认为该做的事。When the first environmental conference was was held by the United Nations um, in Stockholm in 1972, the world really clashed. The developing world came to Stockholm, in many ways led by Indira Gandhi from India, who said, "Poverty is the greatest polluter." So there was a real difference of opinion. Yeah. It was seen that environmental issues were something for the rich countries of the North, yeah. and the South were only, you know, only wanted to focus on the poverty that they felt. Here you have the Secretary General of the United Nations, de Kuelaj, who was uh, the Secretary General who um, appointed the Commission. He was the Secretary General oh, at that time. Yeah. So when I was asked to lead the World Commission, there were sufficient numbers of countries that were concerned to have the Secretary General and the General Assembly announce a new Commission which was supposed to be an independent commission, important for me. Nobody was going to instruct me yeah. about what we were supposed to be saying, analyzing, and uh, suggesting. Mm. And so when I was asked to chair this commission, I was very much aware that unless we find a response to these challenges that can combine environmental concerns with economic development and overcoming of poverty, there is no way, because no country, no people will accept to stay in poverty because people in other parts of the world are feeling the consequences to the environment. And when I chose the commissioners, I decided there has to be more than half of those commissioners coming from the developing world because I wanted it to be a global analysis not a Western-led analysis, but a global one where all the concerns of the developing world were fully taken account of. Mm -hmm. And we succeeded in that. And for that reason, the report was heard. It was heard across the world. People understood the message. The governments across the world realized the drama. The messages were indeed dramatic in many ways and the call for action 
was very sound. In 1987年,布伦特兰夫人在联合国世界环境与发展委员会上发表了我们共同的未来,Our Common they recognized that in order to achieve a balanced uh, and harmonious growth, if you like, when the, both the society, environment and economy is taken care of, we have to change the way we are making politics, we have to change international relations, we even have to change our way of life. Yes. And um, they state in this book that that is difficult, that is not it's going to happen by itself, it requires strong political will. She has a lot of courage. Okay. She is, when she thinks that something is important, she goes for it. Okay. Even if someone is, you know, skeptical or criticizing, she just, you know, go for it. 勇往直前,不为反弹声浪,布伦特兰夫人在永续发展的这条路上越走越坚定。you see, back in the, already when I was Prime Minister and we had delivered the report yes. in 87, we started putting new policies, improving the policies in Norway as well. So by 1990, we had introduced a carbon tax, not only on the mainland industries and on the use of fossil fuels, but also on the continental shelf because that had been excluded in the beginning but from 1990 I decided we must put a, a carbon tax on the continental shelf. You know there was a big outcry in Norway, yes to a certain extent, but across the world in export, oil exporting countries, they couldn't believe that Norway was taxing its own oil industry, you know, its own exports, but we were. And of course, what has happened is the Norwegian continental shelf is much more clean. So when you look around the world in different parts of the world where oil is being extracted, Norway is far above and better with regard to how much emission per ton of oil extracted. She was a pioneer in many ways. Yes. Because she could talk to the leaders of the G8 or G7. She could talk uh, to heads of government all over the world mm -hmm. as colleagues. And so achieved a lot. 实事求是的精神，让学医出身的布伦特兰夫人和其他政治人物很不一样。What is so typical of Brundtland is her sort of uh, the medical doctor's approach to problems. So she has a scientific mind combined with a political one, yeah. and a, a great experience in international affairs. Mm. But I would emphasizes the, the medical doctor part of it because she approaches a problem and trying to articulate the right diagnosis. Mm. What actually is the problem? Mm. And she would read documents, uh, hundreds of pages herself to really, really learn the problem mm. because she felt that as a politician she could not deal with complicated issues just out of a feeling for the political aspect of it, she had to really know the scientific part of it. I was always very determined to base my arguments and my thinking on facts and evidence and research-based results. Yeah. So I felt that was my duty. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, this is not very regular mm. for politicians to be, most of them, 
don't put such a, a great emphasis on it. They, they may be, maybe they don't have the training. For, for me, it was natural. Mm. But people somehow appreciated it. I think it increased the confidence in my arguments, that yeah. they realized that I was always based on facts when yeah. I spoke yeah. and when I argued. 外界很好奇，为什么不论是公共卫生或是国际政治领域，布伦特兰夫人总是游刃有余。原来她是个速读高手。She's a speed reader. She reads very fast. Really? And I think she learned that. She says so. She learned that at uh, Harvard School of Public Health when she was there as a young medical student. So um, I would give her a draft, and she would take it and look at it and say, good. Or she, a memorandum of three pages, and she said, page two is inconsistent with the bottom of page three after a couple of seconds. 考验一个接着一个,布伦特兰夫人在接掌世卫组织后, 在2002年遇上SARS,在全球蔓延的挑战。where I felt strongly that there is no other institution in the world that can give general advice to all governments about what we need to do. And the WHO had never before issued travel recommendations. I then decided that we had to do travel recommendations say to people across the world, unless there is absolute necessity, you should not travel to country X Y, Z, you know? And many people were surprised. Most people, most governments understood that this was necessary. But some, there were examples of uh, political figures who protested. When Toronto got an outbreak of SARS, the Prime Minister of Canada called Dr. Brundtland and uh, asked her not to give an advisory to the <laughs> world that uh, Toronto was affected because it had uh, big economic consequences. It exactly. meant uh, that... Uh, yeah, they will harm their tourists, everything. Yes, billions of dollars, of dollars yeah. would be lost. But Dr. Brundtland uh, said no. She had done it for countries in Asia and uh, for s cities in Asia. She could not treat them. No Canada exception. different yeah. was no exception. Yeah. I don't think many director generals of WHO exactly. would have, have yeah. uh, stood up to a prime minister of yeah. an important country. 原本可能一发不可收拾的SARS疫情，因为布伦特兰夫人的坚持与一视同仁，终获平息。which made it all, reward, all the more rewarding because you knew that she was critical yep. uh, and that she would not uh, sort of let something which was not good enough pass. And of course uh, that meant a lot of responsibility for everybody else who worked for her, that we, we had to live up to extremely high standards. But it was also rewarding to work for someone who uh, set very high standards for herself in her work. She is very open-minded uh, when she wants to, to get a conclusion on anything. Whether it's uh, the color of the, uh, of the wall, new curtains, a uh, new solution for a uh, government, whatever it is, she, uh, she asks uh, every, uh, everyone or, or several around her to get their, their opinion. Um, and uh, after having all, um, all, all the opinions, she makes the decisions if, if she is uh, more or less the, the one to make the decision. Mm -hmm. And that is a good thing because uh, if you only listen to people who uh, gives you the answer you expect or you want, then you are likely to, to get a a bad decision yeah. because you haven't get, get the, yeah. got the other uh, yeah. the, or the inputs. And that is something I use uh, in my work. 布伦特兰夫人强调, 永续发展的定义无需要改变, 
，他很荣幸能成为第一届唐奖永续发展奖的得奖人，也非常感谢能获得这项殊荣。You know, it adds to education, which I think is an important aspect of the donor in this case. I mean, he's thinking much about education of the coming generations, and and to see that uh, research is being made, done, and also shared mm -hmm. and acted upon. So those things are important. The generations that I belong to, and the come and the, the generation after, have not done enough so far to prepare for the future in a safe and prosperous way, taking care of the environment and people's rights to prosperity and safety. Now, but the grandchildren, my grandchildren, they have learned about sustainable development. Already in their early school years, so there is a growing, edu you know, young generation that now have no excuse. They have known since they were small children about the issues. They are the generation that really have to push for change, and of course, we who are in front or have gone in front of them before. Have added to the knowledge base. I personally have done what I can to spread the message over the last 40 years, and now, you know, I will continue as long as I'm alive. But I'm counting on you, the young people, to really run with the torch. Chishu